Hi, nice seeing you again. <laughs> for a while, we didn't see each other. Thank you for having me. So good, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy to have uh, with us Elisa Satyukov, a friend and a colleague, and we worked a lot already together. And I'm hoping that Elisa will uh, come back uh, to Rijeka, uh, where she's so welcome. Uh, I will hand on now to Christian, uh, who is uh, going to introduce our speaker and then uh, let uh, Elisa Satyukov uh, uh, present uh, her talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sanya. So yeah, the, today we have the pleasure to, to have as a guest uh, Elisa. Elisa Satyukov is a lecturer and postdoctoral candidate in Eastern and Southeast European history at Leipzig University. She completed her award-winning dissertation in 2019 that the translation of the title roughly sound like the other side of intervention, a Serbian experience of the 1999 NATO bombing. And so uh, she, with the, uh, her project, uh, she was focusing on, on the 1999 NATO bombing of Serbia as a fellow in the PhD program for trajectories of change. And uh, before she studied uh, East and Southeast European history, comparative literature and Russian studies in Leipzig, Belgrade and Volgograd. She also worked as a coordinator for the Competence Center Central and Eastern Europe Leipzig and the International Meet Ost Festival. Her research and teaching focus is on the entangled history of Eastern and Southeastern Europe from the 19th to the 21st century with a special interest in science, history, gender, memory, post-socialist, post-colonial studies, and theories and methods of historical studies. So today, Elisa, uh, she will talk about the negotiating responsibility, perception of the 1999 NATO intervention and the Kosovo war in Serbia. That it is uh, something uh, very complex. So um, uh, I will give uh, now the floor to Elisa, please. So thank you so much, Christian, for the nice introduction, and thank you, uh, Sanya, for inviting me. So it's it's great to be back, even though uh, even though it's only on Zoom. So I had the pleasure to uh, getting to know the a little uh, better last year when I came with my students, and uh, you do such amazing work. And so it's uh, I'm very happy to present now what has been my PhD research. Um, so um, you won't, you of course, you have the opportunity to criticize a lot, but the book has already been published, so uh, I, I can't uh, include your, your criticism, but Christian is currently working on the topic, so he will uh, do all the, the better work than afterwards. So um, I'm very happy now to share with you, uh, which is like one chapter out of my book, uh, dealing with the question of moral responsibility um, uh, uh, on the NATO humanitarian, so-called humanitarian intervention. And we will just just go in uh, media um, So on March 26th in 1999, two days after the beginning of the NATO intervention, the writer and feminist activist Yasmina Tashanovic noted in her diary of the bombing that afterwards has been published and translated into many different languages. I hope we all survived this war. The Serbs, the Albanians, the bad guys, the good guys, those who took up the arms, those who deserted. The Kosovo refugees traveling through the woods and the Belgrade refugees traveling the streets with their children in their arms, looking for non-existent shelters when the sirens go off. In this way, she created the image of kind of a shared victimhood in which the Kosovo Albanians and the Serbians found themselves in a supposedly similar situation as a result of the war, fleeing and seeking protection. It is precisely this construction of a supposed community of experience that the Croatian writer Slavenka Dracolic criticized in May 99 in an opinion piece in the US weekly newspaper, The Nation, by referring to the number of Serbian diaries and war accounts, such as Jasmina Tejanovic, uh, which in contrast to the Kosovo Albanian testimonies of the war, reached the world public via the internet and other media, to quote her. 
I can see this young writer sitting at his computer. There must have been no shortage of power then in his Belgrade apartment. He sends his emails letter, checks the latest war information on the internet and goes to bed. Meanwhile, his Albanian counterpart with whose suffering he identifies so much, sits in a tent somewhere in Albania or stands in the mud, waiting to cross the Macedonian border. His house is burned down. His computer, if he ever had one, had been taken by Serbian paramilitaries and he doesn't know where his family is. How could it be, Trakulic wonders, that people under the NATO attack in Serbia identified with the hundreds of thousands of Kosovo Albanians fleeing from war that was started by Serbia in the first place? Did the latter, provocatively speaking, not suffer much more than the former? And how and by whom is suffering measured in a so-called humanitarian intervention anyway? Is it legitimate to let people suffer in order to prevent greater suffering? These are some of the questions that the supporters and opponents of the 1998 intervention in the Kosovo war heatedly debated back then in Yugoslavia, in Europe, and across the globe. While much has been said and written about the ambivalences of humanitarian interventions, I would like to focus my presentation not on the political negotiations, but on what I call in my book, the other side of intervention. And uh, uh, Christian just introduced it to us so um, this has been published in 2020. Unfortunately, there is no English translation available at the moment. I hope there will be some uh, someday. Um, but uh, I edited together with my colleague Katarina Ristic a special issue on NATO and the Kosovo War, which has been published last year in comparative Southeast European studies. Um, and both uh, books and the book and a special issue are available open access. So you are welcome to, to have a closer look. So for my research, which I will uh, present, here, uh, present here partly, I looked at very different kind of sources, um, because as you know, the archives are still closed uh, uh, on this topic. So I was um, uh, was researching Serbian, different kind of Serbian print media uh, during the uh, time of the bombing. Um, I was looking on published memoirs and reports and first person documents, um, such as the one I presented uh, you uh, at the beginning, by Yasmina Tishanovic. Um, I looked at, and this uh, was a very, very new thing to do, at uh, digital resources, mainly from the Internet Archive, because the Kosovo War is sometimes considered as the first Internet war. I also wrote a paper on, on this issue I'm happy to share with you. And I also conducted all history interviews in Belgrade. So for feasibility and language reasons, I have focused on the experience of the Serbian society in the NATO intervention. Um, and my research relates only to the non-combatant population and not to the military. And um, I think in particular, the study of Kosovo war, uh, Kosovo sources of the, of the war remains to be explored in more detail. This was something I, I, I unfortunately couldn't address in my own study. So what I will uh, uh, going to present uh, here today is uh, first uh, a short uh, context of the NATO air campaign and what actually means a humanitarian intervention. And then I will um, uh, will focus on the Serbian perceptions first of the NATO bombing and then of the war in Kosovo. And then I end with some concluding thoughts on the question of moral responsibility. So Kosovo, um, as we all know, the, uh, if we look at, Kos at the Kosovo war and the Kosovo conflict, we all know that the NATO intervention was, of course, not the beginning of the war. Um, the whole conflict went back at least to the 1980s and revolved around the question uh, of whom belongs uh, the autonomous Yugoslav province of Kosovo. So the independence efforts of the Kosovo Albanian majority population were repeatedly put down by the Serbian military in the, in the Milosevic government that claimed Kosovo as an integral part of Serbia's history and present, as you are all very much aware. So in a reaction to that, the Kosovo Albanian shadow state was established under the lead, lead of Ibrahim Rugova throughout the 1980s. At the same time, the so-called international uh, community, and here specifically the United Nations and the NATO, uh, was confronted with the question of how to respond to the war crimes in Bosnia. So after the genocide of Srebrenica, this first led to the NATO military operation, the Liberate Force in Bosnia, and finally to the international-led peace nego ne negotiations in Dayton. 
when the Kosovo issue was not uh, resolved uh, in, in Dayton, this, uh, uh, this uh, very much led to resentments that spread, uh, to, sp spread to attacks by the Kosovo or first like uh, but, uh, attacks by the Kosovo Liberation Army, UCK, which began to appear in 1996 and um, tried to assert its claim, its claims of independence by force. So the Kosovo conflict became then a war after the Serbian massacre of the Uchika leader Adam Yashari and his family on March 7 in 1998. All peace efforts by uh, the international community uh, uh, led Kosovo contact group um, uh, came to nothing and the last attempt was in March 99 in Romboye. Um, and one of the conditions of this peace agreement was the stationing of NATO troops in Kosovo, um, which Serbia, as you know, did not accept as a violation of its right of sovereignty. So the answer to the question of international responsibility to prevent war crimes was then war. But this war was not called a war, it was called a humanitarian intervention um, as the leaders of the countries in, involved in the so-called Operation Oilight Force announced to their national audiences on the evening of March 24. So to quote Bill Clinton here, um, we act to prevent a wider war to defuse a powder keg at the heart of Europe that has exploded twice before in this century with catastrophic results. We act to stand united with our allies for peace. By acting now, we are upholding our values, protecting our interests, and advancing the cause of peace. But that, what, what does this uh, actually uh, mean, advancing the causes of peace uh, by a humanitarian intervention? So these are there are different uh, definitions, but um, uh, what I always include is that human intervention is a military campaign um, by the international community or some other actor in an internal or international conflict, if necessary, without the consent of the country in question, in order to save human lives and protect human rights. In the aftermath of the Kosovo War, this was implemented into international law um, as the so-called principle of, uh, of the principle of the responsibility to protect in 2005, um, which is nonetheless not binding. So Václav Havel back then very accurately described um, uh, uh, this, uh, this principle of humanitarian intervention that uh, as uh, this is probably the first war fought not in the names of national interests, but in the names of principle and values. These so-called values were very much controversially discussed at the time, especially the question which life was worth protecting and which was not. As you may remember, the expulsion of the Kurds in Turkey, which was taking place in Europe at the same time, was in any case not work of military intervention, just like hundreds and thousands of human rights crimes before and after it. We cannot go deeply here into the question of international law, um, but we rather want to look on the ground on what such a military or humanitarian intervention looked like. So... Bombs were dropped by NATO mostly at night to avoid civilian casualties. The targets were so-called military obje objective, which means bridges, roads, factories, everything that was important for warfare. Even if the non-combatant population of Yugoslavia was not targeted, the targets were often located in the middle of where people lived. Becoming a so-called collateral damage was therefore a very real danger. With March um, 24, two different and interconnected theaters of war emer emerged or expanded. So these were the daily NATO attacks and the Yugoslav uh, war of defense against NATO on the one side. And this was the ethnic cleansing by Serbian military forces against the Kosovo Albanian uh, uh, people, which led to a mass exodus on the other side. A total of 758 people have been killed by NATO bombs and among them 453 civilians, and most of them in Kosovo. Let us now turn to the Serbian reactions to the NATO bombing. 
uh, illustrated here with what I think is a very great cartoon uh, by uh, by Alexander Zograf in his book on the NATO intervention called Bulletins, Bulletins from Serbia. Um, so uh, you see here uh, someone saying, which is Alexander Sorgraf, yes, my tone was exposed to NATO bombings, but don't worry, I'm safe. I'm safe because their bombs are not rude, they are intelligent and smart bombs. Um, and this uh, very common perception um, of smart bombs and smart warfare is described by Mignati M M M Michael Mignatiev in his book, uh, book uh, in this, uh, with the same title as a virtual war. So for the public outside of Yugoslavia, the NATO intervention was due to the media coverage often perceived similar to a computer game. So someone presses a button, a button and then a bomb falls from far above and hits a target. That these bombs on the receiving end of intervention, as I call it, felt quite real is shown by the reactions from Serbia. So first and foremost, there was outrage. Um, and this was very much connected to the question of collective responsibility. So to quote here, uh, someone from the mailing list Netheim um, uh, in, an, in an email called A Just War, how far is a reaction to a newspaper article published by Susan Sontag? Um, I wonder when will those smart asses like Susan Sontag finally understand that there can be no collective responsibility for any criminal act. There can be no collective responsibility for any criminal act. So he um, repeats this uh, twice ever. This nature's aggression on Yugoslavia is not a just war. It is not a humanitarian war, but a dirty war in which civilian targets are legitimate targets, not collateral damage. This is not a war against Milosevic, but organized terror over 10 million citizens. Um, as one of my interview partners from the NGO scene uh, put it more diplomatically, um, everyone was against this war, but for very different reasons, as we will see, and I will come to the interpretation at the end. Um, so just first to introduce you to these different kinds of uh, reactions. Um, this opposition to the NATO intervention um, was, uh, as I said, expressed in very different ways. And the Milosevic government in particular uh, recognized um, the so-called potential, um, uh, even though it sounds a little cynic, um, but of NATO as a common en enemy and try to use these united stands for its propagandistic purpose, uh, purposes. And this was most, um, uh, most strong expressed in the daily anti-war concerts and in the so-called target campaign. So as you uh, see here that these target signs, uh, they were printed in newspapers, they were given out to people um, at a different kind of demonstrations um, uh, uh, to show that, uh, uh, to show um, yeah, the, the uh, Serbian people as, as, as victims of the, the NATO intervention. Um, and um, especially, and now we come to uh, to the to the third kind of reaction, um, the anti-war movement, which mobilized against Milosevic and his government since the early '90s and fought for peace and democratic values, and um, was so disappointed um, uh, about what was called moral values of the so-called democratic West. Um, the bombing then exposed them to a double threat. So on the on one hand, there were the NATO attacks, and on the other hand, there were the there was the arbitrariness of the Serbian regime in uh, due to the proclaimed state of war. And this uh, terror regime by Ms. Milosevic uh, expressed itself most drastically in the assassination of the critical publisher Slavko Churuvia in the streets of Belgrade on Easter Sunday. And further, the bombing of the Serbian state TV RTS was also a fatal sign that the media were legitimate war targets on the one hand, and that 16 employees had to fall victim to the narrative of victimization and heroic defense of the Serbian regime despite prior warnings. So now uh, we want to look at the Serbian perceptions of the war in Kosovo. Uh, 
First of all, it's important to keep in mind what Orly Friedman very precisely sums up as the NATO bombing in Serbia is often addressed as it, as it, as it have nothing to do with the war in Kosovo. And this is uh, a chapter itself to look at the, the, the media coverage and uh, the way uh, Serbian is also until today, um, as a way to order paper on this, uh, remembering the uh, NATO intervention, which is like completely disconnected to the to the events that were happening in Kosovo before at the same time. Um, so um, in the Serbian media under censorship and in the, and, and in the state of war, um, the war in Kosovo and what was happening there was practically absent. And although it was, of course, very different, uh, difficult to get access to verified information in the situation, um, it was possible, as Mika Tadic, a journalist of the Montenegrin uh, political magazine Monas monitor criticized um, uh, and she said Serbians don't want to know but most of them know they have satellite dishes and shortwave radios they know but they don't care um, one of the reaction to the to the uh, human rights crimes and the ethnic cleansing in Kosovo was uh, blame shifting to uh, Kosovo um, as it was a practice mainly by the Serbian propaganda and the Serbian newspapers and the Serbian government. And in this narrative, the war was exclusively, exclusively the fall of um, the, the, the Kosovo, the so-called Kosovo terrorists, uh, and uh, the, the, so, which mean the Kosovo Liberation uh, Army. And Serbian paramilitary troops, um, as we see here, again, led by our kinds and these kind of guys mobilized to defend Kosovo. Another reaction was um, denial. Uh, and to quote here again from the mailing list, Net Time. Man, what a picture. Hundreds of thousands of ethnic Albanians prove that humanitarian catastrophe, catastrophe is going on and that NATO has a real reason to help. Gosh, if they continue this way, they will soon go over the real number of Albanians living in Kosovo. And what the heck is that? Sounds like they are eager to clear the Kosovo area of any Yugoslav influence. Take back refugees and bring more Albanian people. No need to think twice that this is all crap. It's nothing more than the live pursuit of real-time war movies done on news. So here, someone simply pretended that the humanitarian situation in Kosovo is a lie of the NATO countries to justify the war. Although he engages with the humanitarian question, it is only in the form of denial. There are various examples, especially from the uh, Serbian anti-war movement, um, uh, on the other hand, who condemned the Kosovo war and show solidarity with Kosovo Albanians to come to another point. Um, but however, often they only do so as here in an open letter signed by numerous Serbian intellectuals, only in the form of equitation. Um, and the main narrative here is that Serbian and Albanian civilians are equally threatened, as we were seeing in the beginning of the quote by Yasmina Tesanovic. And in contrast, and here I come to, to my last point, there's a final and very rare form of Serbian solidarity that takes up the question of responsibility. And this is about recognizing that the NATO intervention has reasons, namely um, the Serbian human rights crimes in Kosovo, and that it is the moral responsibility of people in Serbia to recognize the suffering of the Kosovo Albanians and to prioritize the end of that suffering. I think this is a very interesting debate, especially when we link it um, to the current debate on the on the on the on cost, uh, on, on Russia and uh, Ukraine. Um, so Natasha Kandic from the Humanitarian Law Center in Belgrade uh, was 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 one of the people who were very uh, uh, regularly also traveling to Kosovo and then when it was possible uh, to 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 the uh, neighboring countries um, to um, engage with people and especially with the refugees and she was uh, uh, stating many Kosovo Albanians expected people from Belgrade to come and show that they care about what was going on in Kosovo perhaps. A few, few hundred Belgrade intellectuals could have changed Albanian-Serbian relations. 
So three years later, there was a very vivid debate on exactly these questions of, um, of the, the moral responsibility and the reasons for the NATO intervention um, uh, uh, taking place in the journal Freme, um, which is uh, analyzed in a very uh, readable article um, by uh, Jasna Dragovic Soso. So I, I recommend you to, to look into these. And she is showing how the split of the, um, of the Serbian uh, opposition Position on the one hand, but also uh, in the relations of the like civil society um, activists in Kosovo and Serbia uh, goes back to this debate on the NATO intervention and how is this like um, uh, how is this like uh, uh, very much um, uh, has much, very much an impact until today. Um, so now I want to to sum up and um, uh, and try to, uh, to 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 analyze this and link it back to the question of the moral responsibility and um, so ask first the question what does this actually mean moral responsibility and how we can we uh, relate it to this question of the NATO intervention. Um, and I think it's worth to 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 looking in some philosophical accounts uh, on on this question. And uh, first of all, um, I think Hannah Arendt is, is someone um, uh, who uh, who has of course great spots on this. Um, and she uh, this, uh, she distinguishes between um, uh, a legal and a moral responsibility, but also um, points out that every person, and now this is interesting in the, in the connection to, to Serbia, belongs to a community and also to a national community and is thus always involved in political decision-making processes. Um, so only those, to, uh, according to her, who change their national um, connection can withdraw from their community, but this too um, is only a step from one community to another, and thus the exchange of one responsibility for another. Um, and while Arendt argues that each individual person must deal with her own moral responsibility, so this is like very much like an individual question, um, the Israeli philosopher uh, Avishai Magalit goes a step further by arguing for what he calls a universal ethical community, um, whose, as he said, collective moral responsibility it is to assume um, um, uh, uh, responsibility towards extraordinary manifestations of radical evil and crimes against humanity. So um, uh, the philosopher Lillian Alvarez states that none of these both uh, positions are actually coherent as they conflate political and moral responsibility and thus equate guilt and shame. And I think this question uh, of guilt and shame is very much, um, uh, very much uh, connected to, to what we are seeing um, happening in Serbia these days. Um, and uh, with this, I want to give my uh, closing words here to Eric Gordy and uh, uh, open uh, the debate about these questions, who summed this up in his book, uh, I think, very, uh, very, uh, very good to say that the perception was and still remains quite popular in Serbia that any admission of responsibility in the wars of succession could amount to a justification of the NATO campaign, which was almost universally opposed in the countries for reasons that would, no, would not surprise anybody. So this is why we see that this kind of debate um, uh, has not happened until today. And uh, uh, we even see the opposite, that uh, nowadays the NATO bombing um, in the Serbian memory, memory politics is, uh, is uh, more one-sided than uh, it has been ever before. And the, the question of the moral responsibility for what was happening in Kosovo is, uh, have, have never been uh, in detail but nowadays it's not addressed at all in Serbia. So thanks a lot. And uh, with this, I uh, give the word to Christian and I'm looking forward to your thoughts and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, so much. You, you mastered in a very excellent uh, way this, uh, this uh, topic. Um, first of all, because, uh, okay, it is well-structured, you used the very uh, good uh, sources. You uh, were a you were able to 
to compose a very uh, uh, in, uh, entangled and complicated uh, 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 topic uh, uh, from several points of view, uh, historical, also political, and of course, memory and uh, moral and responsibility. So um, that's uh, uh, very um, uh, important and well done in this, uh, in this sense. Um, I have several comments, but uh, I will go straight to, to the core. Um, if uh, we, we, we think about uh, the, uh, the moral issues in, uh, in relation to, to the Kosovo war and NATO intervention, I think that, uh, that there are um, the, the responsibility uh, um, uh, is uh, on several level in according to the historical uh, stage. Um, at the beginning, uh, it all started, uh, and uh, as uh, a BBC documentary said, with uh, with a lie. I mean, in uh, in the eighties, the uh, politician in uh, in Serbia and with the, the Milosevic faction since the end of nineteen eighty six, they uh, said publicly that uh, they needed to protect Serbs and Montenegrinians in Kosovo because they were mistreated by. Uh, the Albanian population. So uh, they thought that uh, removing the autonomy of uh, Kosovo at the time, it was uh, the best possible solution to protect the Serbs and Montenegrinians there. Um, it was something that didn't invent Milosevic at all. It was something that was created in the first half of the 80s, especially with uh, several Serbian intellectuals based in uh, Belgrade and also some, of course, grassroots activists in, uh, in Kosovo. So after that, uh, the, the, the point is that uh, in order, I mean, publicly, at least, <laughs> to protect the Serbs in, in Kosovo, it started a, a reversal process to, uh, um, uh, to offend the uh, human rights of Albanians in Kosovo all along, since the end of the 80s and on, all along the 90s. So then again, this is uh, at, the, in, at a certain point in uh, 98, after all what uh, um, was happening on the ground between uh, the, the clashes between the Kosovo Liberation Army that were, was considered an insurgent rebellion uh, uh, um, terrorist uh, from the point of view of Belgrade. Belgrade, uh, of course, uh, didn't uh, wait uh, to, to make uh, a strong uh, answer to those uh, attacks, terroristic attacks, as they consider it. So, and again, at that point, so uh, the NATO countries decided to protect the Albanians with, uh, with more uh, other violence. Mm -hmm. So it is very complicated. So the point is that in order to uh, protect a particular group, in the end, uh, it, uh, I mean, history shows us in this uh, specific uh, area of uh, Europe that uh, it was necessary to use more violence. So, and uh, I wonder also keeping in mind what is happening uh, today in, in Kosovo and not only in Kosovo, there is uh, of course the, the situation the war in uh, Ukraine and the invasion of, of, of Russia. I mean, how uh, from a um, moral point of view, uh, we, we can uh, uh, get some conclusion, we can get some uh, uh, answer and how to, we can protect uh, the minorities, how, how we can avoid uh, the use of violence, how we can uh, um, change this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, situation that uh, offer just uh, basically violence. So thank you. So this is a very complex question, and I, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, but I think I can't answer this because I'm not in peace and conflict studies. So to to prevent human war crimes, I think this is like, and and how to react to this. So this is, I think, um, at, at the center of your question, and we see, um, and this is what I can do as a historian, just offer um, uh, this perspective, which is based on sources. What was the output of? Of the of the NATO intervention, we can say it was very ambivalent. Um, uh, uh, and as you were just uh, saying, and I was also showing these numbers, um, that what happened with the start of the bombing is that the war spread. Um, and, and, and so, like the most of the human rights 
crimes and uh, ethnic cleansing um, and the expulsion was happening in the three months of the bombing because uh, international community was there was there was this air war but there was no one on the ground um so Serbian pallet military troops could could do what they wanted and they did um and so uh, we saw that um in the fir the first the first uh, uh, result of the intervention was more violence but then of course like the supporters of this principle of humanity and uh, say okay but it, it, it took only three months and then there was peace um so wasn't it uh, can we uh, can we not consider this as successful intervention as it had been done in research for a very long time and also like in a political perspective to say okay at the end um uh, serbian troops were withdrawn um after the uh, commando agreement uh, on 10th of june um and um war was the, the war was uh, ended, but of course, as we also know from other wars, the war did not just end with a peace agreement, because uh, as a follow up to the NATO intervention, the um, uh, the, the Serbs in Kosovo and especially the Roma population in Kosovo uh, were expelled from the Albanian side and they had to flee to Kosovo. And as we see now, the conflict in Kosovo and Serbia is is not solved after more than 20 years. So um, this is the question what we consider as successful. Um, of course, a certain kind of war ended with the with the with, with the command of war agreement and the question is if uh, it could not have ended uh, in other ways um than with the with with a military intervention but um this this is uh, uh not something i think we can address as historians but uh if you look and you do this if you look at the, the political situation and the way the international community um was in Involved in the Yugoslav Wars of Disintegration, we saw a long history um, of doing the wrong steps. Um, and uh, if you look at the Dayton Agreement, and just uh, uh, and this is something that was very much criticized by the Serbian, by the Serbian <coughs> opposition and anti-war movement, that they just. Um, that they just uh, do this agreement with Milosevic. And then there was this huge protest uh, happening in 1996, 90, 90, 97. And so there was such a huge opposition <clears throat> to, the, to Milosevic um, all over the 90s. And there was really like a change, a, a chance of changing directions after the Bosnian war, but uh, it didn't happen. And then the night of war came and the bombing um, and the situation for like the democratic forces in Serbia got even worse. So um, um, I think there was, if we now look back, there were certain steps um, uh, that were taken that must be questioned from, 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 from the international perspective. But what are your thoughts on this? <laughs> so. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Well, uh, it is a, um, uh, as I mentioned, a complex situation. Uh, if uh, I look at the um, the archival work I've done in the past year or so, uh, the, uh, since the after uh, Milosevic uh, uh, supported the explosion of the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina in 1992, since spring, uh, since the since the spring of that year, and especially by the end of that year. In, uh, in the December 1992 with the so-called Christmas warning that uh, Bush father as a president uh, started to say to Milosevic, uh, be aware because if you make explode a new war, even in Kosovo, the United States would be ready to attack Serbia directly. So that was the, the beginning, let's say, of the uh, of having Kosovo uh, under the radar, let's say, the, uh, in the got the attention of the United States. So that was the the first uh, evidence that um, it was, I have found. And all along the 90s, as uh, you, yourself uh, uh, showed us today in the in uh, your uh, presentation when you mentioned the speech of Clinton in uh, in uh, March 24th, saying that we have to uh, prevent. To a, a new um, Balkan war, uh, um, so that that, uh, that was the basically the line uh, of the United States toward uh, toward um, Serbia. But why? Because uh, they wanted to 
avoid a spillover effect that uh, may endanger the security environment uh, all around uh, Kosovo and Serbia. That was to avoid that uh, Serbs killing and make, making, doing ethnic, ethical, uh, ethnic cleansing in Kosovo against Albanians. The flood of refugees in Albania, Macedonia could have destabilized those countries and then uh, could have involved a major conflict involving Greece, Bulgaria, and even Turkey. And Turkey had also you know, some problem with uh, Greece uh, at the time. So the point is that uh, it was a prevention of a major conflict. That was the ratio, the logical line that was followed in Washington. And it was also, um, let's say, shared, those fears were shared with uh, different approaches and point of view also in the Western Europe, let's say. And that, that was what I, 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 I found uh, working in the previous month on this topic from the political point of view. And then of course we have also the <laughs> Belgrade point of view, but it, the story would be maybe too long now. But the point is that uh, from the American point of view, um, it was important to avoid that conflict. But uh, uh, Bosnia was expendable. So if uh, it, it make, uh, there is a dissonance uh, between the uh, official rhetoric of uh, saving uh, lives in, uh, in Kosovo and what was uh, uh, done in, uh, in, in Bosnia, I mean, the inertia of the international community. We had to wait 1995, we had to add uh, the genocide in Srebrenica, we had to, to wait Dayton at the end of 95 in order to have peace there. So and that's it. that is something uh, from the moral and ethical point of view, uh, difficult to, to understand because there is a gap, let's say between politics and uh, between uh, also the, uh, what is said in a rhetorical uh, way in, uh, in uh, public and uh, um, let's say real strategies, if there is something real in all of this. And I would like also, if I may, to, to, to ask you, um, um, you are an expert, uh, as you published also last year, that, um, and uh, you was one of the editors of the, um, of the uh, of that, uh, journal issues last year about comparative uh, studies in Southeast Europe. So um, um, what uh, uh, could help, uh, in your opinion, to, to change this line in, uh, in Serbia as I mean about uh, uh, politics of uh, memory to, uh, to make uh, Serbs more aware of what uh, Serbia have done in Kosovo against Kosovo Albanians uh, during the 90s, especially in 98 and 99. I mean, uh, it looked because uh, today it looked like uh, almost uh, in, uh, impossible to me to, to have a change from that uh, point of view, because due to that's due to politics, that's uh, a, a choice. So, in, in your opinion, uh, as an expert, I mean, what do you think that uh, may ch just uh, changing uh, with a new government, everything will change overnight? Because uh, mm, my my impression is that uh, uh, it is very it is not just uh, related to a single politician but it is uh, something that is more structured and uh, rooted in Serbian society and culture. So um, I wonder if really it is possible to, to change something, have a, a more open, uh, multicultural, but also a more transitional justice in, in Serbia. Thank you. <laughs> Again, very, very, um... A hard question to answer, and I don't. I think I I, I don't have a, a good answer for you because I don't think there will be changes. I think um, there was a certain point in time where it would have been possible to to address these issues. Um, so um, in 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 my article, the special issue, I um, I um, I. Uh, 
I look at 20 years of, or in comparison, 20 years of the memory politics um, of the NATO intervention in Serbia. Um, and what you see is that this narrative of Serbian victimhood and the, just the concentration only on the NATO intervention without even mentioning the Kosovo War, this, this is rooted in 99 and in a whole Milosevic uh, propaganda. And we see this then in 2000 with like the first anniversary um, and what I call the making of 24th of March. So this is this is where the narrative is like implemented in memory politics. Um, and um, and then we saw, of course, a change in political mood um, uh, uh, in 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 the aftermath of the of the NATO intervention because, of course, it was horrible experience for the people. It was so stressful, and it was um, this point where the the change the, the, the mood in society really changed. And um, and we saw that now the the opposition movement uh, get get now back on its feet. Otpor um, uh, was was getting uh, getting uh, more 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 popular. And in the end, um, the overthrow of Milosevic was happening in, in, in October 2000. Um, so there is, of course, a connection to the NATO intervention um, uh, when it comes to this. Uh, but still, it's not linked, of course, on first on the on the on 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 um, on. Uh, on to question like this, the Serbian narrative um, uh, of the NATO intervention, because people were, especially in the beginning, of course, very much focused on their on their own suffering, on their own losses, on their own political situation. So it was just not to time to see like the bigger issue. And I was showing this Freme uh, controversy because it was like the first time um, and very much linked to to Milosevic and and in and in, in, in Haag, um, uh, um, uh, to this question of transitional justice, but this was also addressed like only from a, like a certain group of people who were just more reflexive and and dealing with these issues anyway. So it was not like a broad public debate, but still then with uh, with uh, uh, Jin, then with Jinjic uh, and the, the 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 experience of the assassination of Jinjic, this was uh, also uh, another horrible experience just seeing that the these kind of democratic dreams just just not get fulfilled that easy and that the situation is so um is so complicated uh, in Serbia and then we had this right like long uh, democratic uh, government with Tadic and there were certain steps happening uh, in in terms of transitional justice and cooperation with the ICTY and also in relation to the Kosovo war um but and this is important uh, in the 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 importance of Kosovo for Serbia was never questioned in detail. So um, uh, there were some certain steps to, to address like Serbian um, uh, uh, war crimes, but uh, uh, also, the issue of the NATO bombing was uh, uh, was not uh, addressed critically in this in this connection to the question of responsibility. So, how much was the uh, intervention a reaction to Serbian war crimes? So, these these two things were not linked. Um, but what was happening is basically, especially in these uh, in these in the two thousands, uh, which was for Serbia an important time to get closer to to European Union and for democratic transitions in general. Um, that uh, the, the the NATO bombing wasn't just not addressed in the public. So um, if you look at the different kind of universities, in some years it, 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 there wasn't there was nearly no reporting in the media um, because it, it it was just not. Um, it doesn't fit to the overall narrative of democratic change, but still it couldn't be couldn't be addressed in this connection to the Kosovo war because of course people were suffering um, and people were uh, were not um, almost people were were not ready to 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 connect uh, their own suffering to the cause of Kosovo um, and then we saw again the change happening with uh, Vucic and the current government and um, they uh, really reinvented uh, the, the NATO or well, we cannot even talk about the reinvention because Vucic was uh, the minister of information in 1990 so he basically invented the, uh, the whole uh, uh, yeah uh, narrative of the the the, the, the Serbian uh, victimhood and um and he just um 
followed up basically on what he had done in 99. Um, but still he brought the memory of the NATO bombing back to the public. And this is very much visible when we look at 2015, which was the first time that like really huge anniversary took place in Belgrade in front of the Generalstadt building. It was screened on TV and it was very, very dramatic, uh, dramatically uh, uh, um, uh, with, with uh, like the, the ghosts of the the, um, of the people who were who died uh, through the uh, in the NATO bombing, who reappeared on the stage and told their own story, so it really touched the heart of the people. And this uh, now, uh, I, I stopped my research in 2019, but it was very interesting when I lived in Belgrade, which is uh, which was in 2012 and 2016. Most people, especially younger people I talked to, um, weren't. Um, they, they were either were more like also have like more this nostalgic feelings on the bombing so a lot of them were like telling the stories of we had a very good time and it was like school break and we were hanging out a lot and um and of course, this is also a, a way of, of dealing with trauma, but but still, it wasn't it wasn't um, very much like uh, nationalized or uh, or however uh, the memory of the NATO bombing. And when it comes to the anniversary, it didn't play any role. So it was 24 of March. I was there several times asking people, "What do you do today?" So what should I do? I hang out with people. So it wasn't wasn't that like a specific date in their like uh, national calendar, as Olive Friedman calls it. And this really changed with like uh, Vucic's attempt to bring back into public memory that even younger people are now nowadays much more aware of what was happening in 99 and do much more connect and uh and 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 uh, and uh, i think this is this is um this is the, con the, the opposite of what you were saying on how can we, we bring people to think about what was happening in Kosovo. I think the completely opposite, uh, opposite is happening for some years now. And I, I don't know how to to address this because it's it's it, it most of the time it was only NGOs addressing these issues uh, anyway. And now even NGOs have such a hard standing and official narrative is 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 such everywhere in the media and in the public memory um, that I don't see this happening anytime soon. So I'm so sorry for not being more optimistic. <laughs> Maybe others have other opinions on that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Lisa. Um, and I would have thousand other other comments, but uh, I I would like now to to give the floor to other to our participants uh, because I'm sure that uh, there will be some uh, question or comments. So. Well. Ah, okay. Uh, Tomas, please. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for your talk and for your discussion. It was really illuminating. So my question is quite, uh, you know, I'm not a historian, so so apologize for this uh, naive question. My The question will be uh, simply to in the way of alternative history, what would probably happen if NATO would not intervene? So is then is that American logic that you suggested, Christian, that uh, there, would, the, there was some kind of escalating potential? And uh, is this logic uh, for historical point of view quite, uh, uh, yeah, based on the facts more or less? Uh, or um, yeah, so what would happen if the NATO or the USA uh, did not intervene into this conflict, uh, whether it was be even worse? So this is uh, my question, because we are always um, focusing what uh, bad happens if someone did, you know, someone act, and then we see the, the, the effects that are very controversial, ambiguous. But we forgot uh, what would have happened if this act had did not appear. So, so this this is my question. So, thank you, Christian. You would like to go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it is uh, 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 basically impossible to <laughs> to say what would could have happened. I mean, then in in Serbia they published uh, um, a book, uh, probably something like two three years ago about that with the counterfactual uh, history 
of, uh, of, uh, of Serbia. And there is also a chapter about the, um, uh, about the Kosovo War. Uh, but let's say from, from my, my point of view, um, if uh, NATO uh, didn't intervene, uh, it most probably the, uh, uh, the, uh, the escalation in, in, of the conflict in Kosovo would have raised uh, the, the uh, number of refugees, uh, not to mention the victims of Albanians, would, would have grown a lot. And uh, we have to remember one thing that uh, by the end of 98, beginning of 1999, the Kosovo Liberation Army was uh, really in bad times because uh, it was, uh, most of it was crushed by the Yugoslav and Serbian forces. So uh, it was really uh, possible that a humanitarian catastrophe from that point of view would be very, very uh, possible at, at the time view of that, uh, there was uh, uh, the, the sense of revenge from the Serbian side for what happened in 1998. So uh, it is uh, difficult to estimate the alternative, but uh, for sure, uh, the, from a humanitarian point of view, it would, be, would have been very hard time, even if I can tell honestly, if uh, the, uh, what was supposed to be the so-called spillover effect in the region and the risk of a new Balkan war, I can tell that. I mean, it is very, there are too many variables in that, uh, in, in that game. But uh, one thing is important to mention for the historical fact that uh, um, in Albania, in the Northern part of Albania, there were Kosovo Liberation Army training camps and they got, uh, uh, weapons uh, uh, from countries abroad, including the West. There are books about that, about that and evidences. So it could have, uh, the, the conflict could have been uh, prolonged as a frozen conflict, as a, a conflict with a Gaza style conflict uh, with uh, Albanians protesting against the Serbian authorities. So that's my impression, let's say. I, probably it would be, uh, a frozen conflict uh, with uh, humanitarian uh, issues, very dangerous uh, humanitarian issues. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with Christian said. In, in general, I'm not so sure things would have been escalating so fast. So that what you describe, Christian, here is a human humanitarian catastrophe, um, which we were then witnessing in, in from March to June, if this would would happen without the NATO intervention in this intensity. Um, I definitely agree that uh, it would would have been a frozen conflict for a very long time with uh, um, with uh, uh, people expelled from from the country and fleeing and um, of course with with a lot of, of suffering and um, and civilians killed but over a much longer period and not in this in this like uh, intensity of these three months um, and so this would be a question or if there would not have been other ways to to stop these uh, kind of war crimes than uh, bombing from the air. Um, and of course, um, the international community was still um, was still thinking about uh, Srebrenica and how, how they couldn't uh, do anything without weapons and just witnessing like a genocide. And um, so uh, they were very much uh, under stress to, to, to react accordingly. And this was also, if you look like from the media reporting from all sides, so like the, the, the term genocide is, is everywhere. So everyone was, uh, was proclaiming a genocide and also, if you look at the German media, they were, were, were having like this um, uh, secret documents on on the plan from the Serbian side to um, uh, 
of 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 uh, of an ethnic cleansing uh, uh, campaign against Kosovo, which then didn't prove to be war uh, to be to be true, but still this was like one of the um, references why Germany was for the first time after the Second World War involved in a military conflict. So this was also a very huge issue. Um, so um, I'm I'm not so sure about the the character of the conflict um, uh, without a NATO intervention, but still the main question, um, how can it be solved to say that Kosovo uh, wanted to gain independence and Serbia until, uh, until today says no. Kosovo was part of Serbia. So how should you deal with the situation? So ideally, you sit on the table and just make the pro and cons, and then you, I don't know, come up, come up with some offer which doesn't involve like uh, a war and uh, and the military. But um, I think we don't live in this world. So um, as some kind of war would have happened. Uh, the question is which kind um, and what, and I think this is the larger question, and we also face this with uh, uh, with Ukraine at the moment, what is the role and the responsibility of the international community? Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Van yes, uh, thank you. First of all, thank you, Lisa, for presentation, wonderful presentation, and Christian also for uh, I understood organizing it and also uh, his comments. I, I would like to ask something, a comment from Elisa, maybe also from Christian or from other people which I see are listening to, about uh, not just merely the Kosovo conflict and how it, it, it stands as an important uh, in a watershed, but also the, the uh, how um, in the same years, let's put it away, because before the Kosovo conflict, there were very really too little of the possibility of uh, see what could that done could have been done or not in the case, because they really we could say that it's only two or three years after Dayton, so it's you really know, but in general, maybe you also analyzed the situation. After so, in a way, the intervention, the international intervention, is not merely the one about how to end the Kosovo war, right? It's also uh, okay. It's up to now. You know, you're not following right now the situation, but you've been following for some years after the uh, the peace, the, the agreement. And uh, I was thinking how, from these two kinds of perspectives, you know, the agreement that was made right after the war or the intervention too, and what has been followed, comparing to other situation of conflicts and international intervention, of course, Dayton comes first, but in general, in the 20th century, when we see that when there is eruption of war and violence, we see it, we have been seeing a trend of uh, uh, partition to solve conflicts and to mitigate possible other conflicts and then in general of nation of strong nationalization against minorities and you could say this all along the 20th century in in different areas of europe also southeastern europe of course so i was i was curious to see your uh, view on how this two situation you know the uh, uh, in terms of how they um they influenced the uh, the ethnical uh, well the international conflict not in terms of the war but in general the, uh, in comparison to other situation how you know the, the intervention for the war and 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 that that part of of the tro effort to res to you know mitigate the conflict and what happened after because Kosovo in a way it is a little strange in terms that it was not decided for a partition. You know, there was an idea, either it was not, of course, it was, you know, it severed from Serbia in the, in the, you know, in the, uh, in the mind or in the perspective, in political strategy, but still as a whole, you know, and it was not pursued the kind of a partition that was pursued in Dayton. So I wanted to ask the, to see from this decision, which was made then and the years after, how do you see it in a historical perspective? This, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Should I go first or do you would like to answer, Christine? 
No, please go go first. Uh, so this this is also a really hard question. Um, um, how to to situate this intervention in a historical perspective? Because um, if you look at uh, especially the, the research in, in in peace and conflict studies and political sciences on the on the NATO intervention, it is always described as this kind of watershed. Um, so here, as I was quoting Václav Fabel, so here here things change and the moral moral issue comes in, and this is like really uh, like a different different perspective. Um, and um, and I think um, in some sense, this is, this is true because the, of course we see a lot of um, uh, military intervention that were happening all over the uh, 19th and 20th century. And um, there's a great book on, on this issue too, on the uh, humanitarian intervention, this, 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 this human cause, of course, is, is 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 like a product that that comes up in the in the, in the nineteenth century. So it's not just uh, in ninety nine that, that that there are like military interventions for for humanity, but that it is um, uh, uh, proclaimed as such an important step to change the war, and also with what was happening then um, uh, uh, in international law with the responsibility to protect. Um, I would rather say it is uh, the end of a long process of, um, of, of, of doing this kind of military intervention for humanitarian causes without having like the legal permission to do it. Um, you know what I mean? And this is in there, in this sense, Kosovo is the game changer. It's not the, the, the first or the last time that it had happened, but um, but afterwards these like human cause was implemented in this responsibility to protect. And this is something I think um, uh, very, very important to, uh, to, 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 to think about how can we, how can we deal with a situation that uh, human uh, why, uh, rights uh, crimes are happening in a country and uh, we have no, and the international community has no, no possibility to stop this? But on the other hand, if we see that this principle is not binding, and then we saw uh, Syria happening and so on, um, then then of course we can question um, how 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 worth is this humanitarian um, uh, issue when it's not uh, not that uh, when it's not uh, the thing that we put in 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 in, in the center of our considerations. Um, uh, so uh, I I would say the awareness. It raised a lot of awareness, but also, of course, a lot of criticism. Because if you if you follow this principle to act on moral grounds, you have to define what are the moral grounds. And I was showing this in my presentation, and also uh, to justify why why you why you uh, intervene in this specific conflict, but not in another. So, and then is the question, what would be the end of this? So if we just act on these moral grounds by military means, um, uh, how, uh, um, how, how, how could this look like? So what kind of world would, would, would we live in if this is like the, 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 the answer to, to certain conflicts? And um, so I, I would say in these historical perspectives, um, that Kosovo was was an important step to to address this issue, but I would say that we haven't answered the question until now from like a legal point of view, from like a philosophical philosophical point of view. Um, and uh, I think it's really, and we saw this now with Ukraine, it's really really uh, worth to to uh, to to think about and uh, this more deeply, and also to uh, look at the different kinds of intervention, as you said in a comparative perspective in order to gain the knowledge and really find answers on how to how to react on these uh, conflicts. Christian, what do you think? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, uh, Elisa. And uh, well, I may just add uh, maybe uh, this, that uh, the Kosovo War was different uh, from, uh, for example, from uh, what brought uh, uh, in the end to Dayton, for example, in a comparative way, for a, a rather simple reason. Because uh, uh, with the, the NATO bombing of uh, the uh, Serbian uh, army in, uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina in, uh, in, at the end of 94 and during 95, 
uh, there was a, a United Nations Security Council. Uh, um, so, so they worked and NATO worked under uh, with the cover, the legal cover of the United Nations. In, uh, in, in during in occasion of the Kosovo War and the NATO bombing of uh, Yugoslavia in '99, there was not that uh, uh, United Nations Security Council uh, um, a resolution to uh, support the NATO bombing. So the, I think that uh, the watershed is that. And that's why after uh, 24 years, we are uh, still thinking about the uh, NATO intervention against Yugoslavia. Because uh, um, we had, uh, the, um, in the end, uh, if we, we, we try to be objective on that, it was uh, a deep change in the structure of the, uh, of the world the power as it was thought after the end of the Second World War, Russia uh, and China were against the uh, that resolution in uh, at, by the end of '98 to the beginning of '99. So uh, the the use of force against a sovereign nation was uh, considered not in order to protect a, a, a minority was uh, considered unacceptable for countries like Russia and China because they have their own tr troubles with the Chechenia in Russia in the 90s, with the, uh, China and uh, Tibet uh, even probably today. So uh, as you see, uh, uh, if we try to do a, com a comparison of the Kosovo war with the other cases, I think that the, the most, uh, the elephant in the room, I mean, the, the, is uh, the, the change of the security system uh, as it was, uh, uh, created after the end of the Second World War. And that's something that it, it is used even today by Putin's propaganda. And because uh, uh, he recalls very often the fact that uh, as NATO bombed the Yugoslavia in 99 without the approval of the United Nations, he, he thinks that uh, he is in the right position to do exactly the same in a symmetrical way to invade uh, uh, and uh, uh, Ukraine in order to protect the Russian minority in, in Ukraine. So that's what uh, I, I, my, my comment on that. So if um, th there are no other questions, uh, uh, no, Javier, please. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa, for your fantastic talk. I think it was really, really great. I think it, it really uh, puts uh, like the perspective of a, of a historian. And, and uh, as uh, Christian was saying, we, we get to see a lot of documents and a lot of information. Uh, I just probably want to uh, put out a comment uh, on the like uh, what has been developing in, in these last comments, not like the how this can or cannot become like a, a case study for like the international arena, because I think this is uh, the Kosovo war has been, uh, uh, or from as Christian just said, from the Russians, for example, it was a, an a, a, um, example of how, what to do in a specific uh, war. But I think it's a, like, a, uh, like everybody uses any kind of, I mean, can a war be used as an example for something else? I mean, this thing about uh, moral war is like the morals of whom? Like, re like really, like this shifts us all the time. I mean, Christian mentioned Putin, but of course the Americans, they didn't do the same with the, uh, the situation in Israel and Palestine. It's a completely different thing. And uh, there is another situation in Morocco and the West Sahara where there is a completely different thing. I just uh, saw that at the beginning of this month, uh, the foreign minister of uh, Ukraine, Kuleva, he went to, to Morocco and accepted Morocco's claims on the, the territory of the West Sahara, which is contended in the international arena, because they wanted to get like the Moroccan support, of course. So it's like they are saying, the Ukrainian um, foreign ministry was saying that they, they respect the, 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 in, the territorial integrity of Morocco. As if it was part of the of the Moroccan country, uh, in, I mean, it, it was not. So I mean, it, what I want to say is like uh, 
everybody uses a moral kind of claim to like do an intervention or not. We can say the same with NATO doing it in Libya, doing it in, in Afghanistan, what happened in, I mean, Afghanistan and Iraq. These were Iraq wars, Iraqi wars. And I mean, we cannot forget that the, the, the first ones to invade was a coalition of the US, the UK and Poland going into Afghanistan. I mean, this is, a, 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 there was no direct connection with anything else. It was like a moral war again. And uh, I, it, it seems like the, I mean, as a, um, yes, like a, as an explanation of something else, it just doesn't work. It just messes up the whole situation all the time. Like, uh, I don't know what you think. So I, I absolutely agree um, uh, with, with what you're saying. So thank you for for your first for your nice feedback and also for your comment. And I think that the important question you 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 was were, was uh, the morals of who, <laughs> and I think um, this is uh, very very important to address. And also then we come back to the historical perspective that we did such uh, important and huge step. Um, to center human rights after after the Second World War, and um, to create a world that is based on human rights, um, and um, the the shift that is happening, and I think this is very much worth to look into more deeply. And we can we we can do this now also because we have uh, more access to to the archival work records. Is the end of the Cold War, and Mary Sorotti just wrote this great book. I don't know if you uh, if you heard about this. Not one inch, and it's about the the. Security Security, world security order after the end of the Cold War. And she's describing this, this very moment where it was not quite clear that like NATO will like will, will like be the big thing uh, in the world after the Cold War, but uh, it could rather be like the OCE and just like a world that is concentrated on collaboration, multilateralism, and human rights, and um, and uh, not so much on like uh, um, pres preserving the security order of the uh, of the Cold War, World War, uh, Cold War, and we see now that this did not happen, <laughs> um, that we live now in a world that is that a lot of people very much reminds on the Cold War. And um, and uh, and I think Kosovo and Christian was just saying this was like the first very important moment after the 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 end of socialism um, uh, and the the the, the Democratic or the changes uh, in 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 in, in post-socialist Europe um, to re reinvent kind of this security order that existed for such a long time after the end of the Cold War world, and this is something that uh, Putin is addressing and is very much uh, uh, um, uh, relying on in in his uh, argumentation why it is uh, right to uh, to intervene. And, and this is also kind of when we look at these Putin speeches, Christian and I we were discussing this a lot. The whole wording reminds you so much on on uh, on on this on this Kosovo intervention. Uh, so even with the special operation so this is uh, really the question how do you frame this war and how uh, you justify this war and Putin is, is doing a similar thing that has been done in the Kosovo war but from the other side and this is really the question of, of morals then so and this is how morals can also and the question of humanity and morality can also be exploited for different kind of causes because who has the right to define which 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 lives should be should be uh, should be saved and which not so and I think um, there was a, a huge understanding uh, how to address these issues uh, from like international perspective after sec the Second World War and this is something that was. Um, was questioned with this so-called humanitarian intervention, and um, and this is this was a big step, and it was done by NATO and by the West, and this is something that needs to be critical assessed, but. Um, on the other hand, there is no no space to critically assess these issues because um, uh, because 
then you you serve the cause of 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 of, of people like Putin who who use the same arguments but for completely different reasons and this is why it's so and Christian and I were complaining a lot that it's so hard to do this research because everyone hates it and everyone disagrees <laughs> and it's just uh, feels like still not uh, the right time to to address these uh, these very complex issues but Christian <laughs> Thank you, thank you, uh, Elisa. Well, uh, just this, yeah, it is difficult to engage with such kind of research because uh, having a critical assessment toward uh, NATO in 99, for example, could be just go in the hands of a uh, um, nationalistic rhetoric for uh, a political uh, reason in the East. So that's unpleasant from a certain point of view, but I think that it must be done anyway. So uh, I would like to, to thank you so much, Elisa, for uh, uh, her uh, presentation, uh, the discussion and the, con the quality of the contents. And um, I, I don't know if uh, Sanya would uh, like to have the last word or no. OK, so thank you to all of you, to the uh, participants, and uh, hope to see uh, in another occasion. So. See Thank you. you so much for the great discussion. <laughs> so, see you. <laughs> okay.